O Lord, absolve your people of their offenses, that the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our fatality may have brought upon us, we may be delivered by your bountiful goodness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're getting closer to the end of Hosea, as Hosea is, again, continuing to warn the northern tribes uh, about the people of Assyria, uh, that they need to return to the Lord. And it's one warning after the next warning, after the next warning, after the next. And so after all these warnings, uh, you have uh, the strong urge or desire for Hosea to tell the people, you need to not just know that Lord is out there, but to believe it, trust it, and stay away from the other gods. So we are in uh, chapter 12. And last week, we just got through picking up uh, the second exodus. And it kind of ended as Israel as a deceiver. Uh, keep in mind that the chapter beginnings are, were not necessarily originally written there in the Hebrew. Um, so now we're into the section of Israel as a, a deceiver. And um, the Bible Project has um, this uh, to... Uh, or symbolize it. Um, Hosea is going to be focusing a lot on uh, Jacob. Mm. Okay. And you might be thinking, well, wasn't Jacob one of the good guys? <laughs> Deceiver. <laughs> well, here's something interesting that we need to remember about the patriarchs and <laughs> matriarchs. Okay? okay. They were just as good of a sinner as you are. <laughs> Maybe better. <laughs> Maybe even better. I don't know. I'm pretty good at sinning, okay? Um, so the, the whole purpose of this is for God to show his love and his grace. Uh, so should we expect Jacob to be perfect? No. If you expect Jacob to be perfect, I don't want to know what you expect of your pastor then. Okay, because bottom line is none of us are perfect. And that's something we need to keep in mind, especially this weekend's uh, message will help remind us of that. Just a little bit of a plug in there. Mm -hmm. Come to church on Sunday or Saturday. So we talk about <laughs> Jacob's uh, lying and tre uh, treachery, and eventually we'll also get to Israel's uh, rebellion. Yes, John. Do, do the people make the leader, or does the leader make the people? No. Hey, I love that profound question. <laughs> do the just... people make the leader and do the leader make the people? The answer is yes and no. Okay? So the leader can lead. So I can teach. But if you're not willing to listen, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, likewise, uh, you need somebody that's going to explain God's word to you and teach you. Uh, but, you know, if I'm not doing a good job in explaining God's word, uh, you might need to find somebody else, okay? Or if I go a different direction. So it's a little bit of both here. And so what Hosea is trying to teach the people is it's all about God. And so let's uh, dive into this. Uh, from Hosea chapter 12, verse 1. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria, and oil is carried to Egypt. And so I immediately grab uh, from uh, Job chapter uh, 15, verse 2. Uh, Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? So we're having a little bit of fun with the concept of wind and the east wind. And I like this idea of windy knowledge. Yes. Okay. A, a lot of hot air, so to speak. Now, the east wind does have a very negative connotation to it. So let's pick that up here. Uh, so from Hosea 12.1 highlights Ephraim's spiritual folly and unfaithfulness using vivid imagery to illustrate their misguided pursuits and alliances. 
Uh, feeding on the wind, a metaphorical language depicts uh, Ephraim's futile at efforts and empty pursuits. Just as one cannot sustain themselves by consuming wind, Ephraim's actions are fruitless and ultimately lead to spiritual emptiness. Okay? So, you know, you cannot feed on the wind. Okay? You need the wind, but uh, guess what? Uh, we need to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. We need something tangible. Now, the east wind... Pursuing the east wind. The east wind in biblical uh, imagery often symbolizes disaster or judgment. Ephraim's relentless, relentless pursuit of the east wind signifies their persistence in seeking calamity or destruction rather than turning to God for guidance and blessing. And so bringing in another Bible passage from Ezekiel chapter 17 verse 10. Behold, it is planted Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Yes. Wither away on the bed where it is sprouted. So, yeah, the east wind is not necessarily a good symbol. So when you put all of this together, you basically have Ephraim chasing after nothing, and it's going to destroy them. Welcome to uh, the king of Assyria coming in. Yes? What is the um, the oil? What? Why is that a thing to say and the oil is carried. I'm going to let Dawn answer that question, who's right behind you. <laughs> oil was carried to Egypt. Olive trees did not grow in Egypt, so Israel exported olive oil to secure an ally against potential threats from Assyria in the east. So we were using that to buy their protect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so they were using the oil to uh, bribe Egypt to help protect them. But you're right, uh, the oil did not grow in Egypt naturally, but it did in the Middle East. So it's kind of interesting, if you could have a little fun with this. Let me just pick up on what Dawn said and uh, the question that uh, Londa is bringing up. And just sit there and say, okay, so when you take a look at the Middle East in today's world and its value, there's a lot of money attached to um, oil, not olive oil, but uh, the black oil or black gold, so to speak, okay, uh, for petroleum oil. But it, it's interesting when you see passages like this, if I want to have a little fun with this oil here, and you could almost sit there and say, yes, but God is saying, you know, out of all the Middle East, where, there, where is there one section where there is no petroleum oil? Really in the promised land. It's the Harrison, the Harrison. Okay. Everything else around pretty much has some access to petroleum oil. So it's interesting that God says, uh, you know, here's the promised land. Uh, just focus on the olive oil. That's going to really sustain you. The petroleum oil, don't worry about. <laughs> they had no use for petroleum yeah, They oil. didn't back then. <laughs> Nowadays, everyone's sitting there going, hey, wow. But again, if you ask people in today's world, um, you know, about oil, black oil, petroleum oil, they're like, oh, yeah, we get excited. We can make money off of this and so forth down the line. But it's, we have to realize life is more than just making money. It's yeah. about uh, being in relationship with God and living in God's relationship with other people. And that's where your olive oil comes in. And I'm sure John has many recipes in the back of his mind with the artistic use of olive oil, right? Well, you can't live without olive oil. That's the spirit. I love it. I love it. That's where I wanted to go. Well, you know, the funny thing is that you mentioned the East. I mean, the East is where we get our bad weather here. So, you know, yeah, well, yeah, we, uh, our, the predominant winds are from the west, but yes, uh, uh, this is, the east wind is considered to be a uh, negative uh, wind. But let's go on to verse two. Uh, the Lord has an indictment against Joseph, Judah, sorry, and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. So it's never good when God has an indictment against you. I'll just put it that way. So from Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, uh, Paul wrote uh, New Testament here. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of, uh, of wrath. When God's righteous judgment will be revealed, 
he will render to each one according to his works. So bottom line is, uh, you're getting this imagery that, uh, yes, God's wrath is going to come, but it's because they condemned themselves. They did it to themselves. It was their own actions that is being, that's bringing upon this. So God is not necessarily an evil God. He's a good God. But if you're going to continue to disobey and push God away, then guess what? You can expect uh, God's wrath to occur. John? The thing that's interesting there, he doesn't, the word words is not in there. Instead, he uses deeds and works. And oh. Think about words. Hmm. Yeah, we, we talk about how we can sin by thought, word, and deed. Uh, but what's being demonstrated here, or um, he will be repaid according to the deeds, mm -hmm. you got to remember in a judicial system okay the judge cannot like thinking the the will county court system or state court system the judge cannot look into a heart but the judge can look at actions okay god can look in the heart but i can't look into the heart but we can look at other people's actions yes. and so very often scripture focuses on the actions even though god does know the heart and sometimes he's patient to allow the heart to make it really obvious, are you with God or not? And so that's why uh, scripture puts a strong focus on the actions, the deeds, instead of uh, the thoughts. But our relationship here is with prayer. Yes. So, yeah, so yes, we can sin by thought, word, and deed, and likewise, God knows our thoughts, and so um, he knows our prayers, he knows... Uh, uh, everything that is going on, and so we recognize that, and we repent, and we uh, return to him, and he loves us and forgives us. Yeah, Mary. Well, that thought, word, and deed is not works. I thought works is the things that you do for other people, like feeding the poor and, and that type of thing. Hold on that's a second. A deed, and if, if that's where people get the idea that works are, they have to do other things for other people. God judges you by your works. Okay, by, um, okay, so God is going to take a look at the heart, yeah. okay, and faith is the key, faith and trust in the promises of God, and as we have faith, it does uh, motivate us, change us, um, and we in turn then do good works. Uh, good works are th anything that is done through faith, whereas um, those who don't believe, they can actually still do works per right. se, but because of the lack of faith, it's not considered to be a good work from God's point of view. So we're still saved by God's grace through faith, okay, but realize that as Christians, uh, as we have faith, and as scripture reminds us, the faith isn't just alone. Faith will naturally produce works. So when we come time for the day of judgment and the sheep and the goats being divided with Jesus illustration there, uh, he talks about how um, to the faithful, whenever you did it to the least of these brothers, you did it to me. And then to those who were disobedient and didn't believe, they're like, when did we ever see you? So, again, it was very much focused on external works because, again, back on that judgment day, God knows, but now it's just going to be obvious to all the world. And so then our works are going to be um, displayed, so to speak. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we are going to be repaid to our deeds to which we might start thinking, wait a minute, Lord, um, we're sinners. Well, okay, then we've also confessed and realized that confession is also a good work. We're saying, yes, these deeds that I did, I don't want to be attached to me. Okay? And so now we're making a public statement and saying, this is not good. This is wrong. And so that's also obvious. So keep that in mind as, uh, yes, we live in the state of grace. We live in the state of forgiveness. And what we say and do uh, is, uh, you could say, 
uh, is revealing the condition of our heart, um, and it will be then judged and finalized on the last day. Did I kind of answer your question, or did I get around it too much? Okay. Then uh, let's um, let me move on. And I don't know what happened to my screen. It went away from me, but uh, I'm back on track. Uh, let's get back to verse 3. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and his manhood, and in his manhood, he strove with God. So here we're talking about Genesis chapter 23, verse 26. Uh, afterwards, his brother came out holding, uh, with, with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Uh, Isaac was uh, 60 years old when she um, uh, bore them. So um, you have Jacob um, coming into this world, hanging on to Esau's heel. Okay. And so uh, Hosea picks this up, again, talking about Jacob. Um, in the womb, he took his brother by the heel. Okay. And you might be thinking, okay, is that really, is that good or is that bad or is that just a statement? Um, some people will take a negative connotation to that, but um, I, I will steer away from a negative connotation and just keep it just neutral um, and maybe chalk it up to sibling rivalry. <laughs> I'm an only child, so I really don't know. But in watching other people with sibling rivalry, I understand a little bit of that. Jam or is that, root. Is that a woman? It says she bore them. The last sentence. Oh, uh, that, that's a uh, um, mom. Mom. Um, They're just saying how old her husband was. Right, right. In other right. words, he was an old guy. She was younger. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. He did She was 18. No, I think it's him. That's Probably younger. It could have been, yeah. He was saying about his wife. So here, yeah, here we're talking about Rebecca. So, I, <coughs> so, um, so Isaac was 60 years old when um, Rebecca bore them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you're, you're just like, well, why don't they give credit to Rebecca? Because she's a woman. <laughs> that is a reasonable answer, yes. yes. Let's go on to verse 4. He strove with the angels and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. Uh, he met God at Bethel, and there God spoke with us. Uh, so from Genesis chapter 32, verse 26. Uh, then he said, uh, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And uh, he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Okay, so again, you have uh, this reference to Hosea is just bringing this back into their mind that he strove with God, um, uh, met God at Bethel. Uh, God spoke to us. So let's continue on. Uh, verse 12, <laughs> And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. This is from uh, Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. And at the top, uh, it reached heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the place, uh, verse 19, And he called uh, the name of that place Bethel. Uh, but the name of the city was Lutz, uh, at the at the first so Hosea is recalling this we're, we're talking about a little bit of the life of um, uh, Jacob um, and then let's go on verse 5 the Lord the God of hosts the Lord is his memorial name okay so let's get into uh, a little bit of uh, some uh, back to Genesis chapter 28 verse uh, 18 so early in the morning, Jacob took a stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillow, pillar and poured oil on top of it. Okay, now I'm bringing in Genesis 35, verse 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, referring to God, referring to the previous verse, verse 18, a pillar of stone, he poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. Okay, so you can assume that maybe the pillar sort of 
eroded or fell apart or whatever, and Jacob restored it. It had a flat top, so think that something could stay on it. It had to. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. How do you stack rocks on top of one another? <laughs> it's just... Yeah, they're flat. Oh, uh, they could be flat, yep. Yeah. Uh, that might be a good way. Round rocks uh, would be very difficult. <laughs> be uh, rocky. Yes. I have a hard time sleeping on it also. Uh, okay, so let's go on to uh, verse uh, 6. Uh, so you, by the help of your God, uh, returned. Hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. So I'm bringing in Luther here. Uh, Luther writes, uh, he, he is applying and explaining the story. You will return when you hold fast to mercy and justice and hope in God, when you have, when, not when you flee to Egypt, etc. You are absolute liars when you abandon God and look for strange gods to worship. Okay, so Luther has some very harsh words for the people during the time of Hosea saying, why are you abandoning the God, returning to Egypt, so to speak? Uh, instead, we need to return to the Lord. So Hosea is saying, now here's the key point here, by the help of your God, uh, by the help of your God, return. You cannot return on your own. So think about this. If you're rejecting God, okay, and you need God's help to return to God, it's not going to work very well. You need to be embracing God's help in order to uh, be in relationship with God. And where you might have learned this, hopefully, uh, Luther's small catechism, the third article of the Apostles' Creed, um, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Martin Luther writes the following. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So notice the role of the Holy Spirit is to keep us mm -hmm. pointed toward Jesus. Without the role of the Holy Spirit, we would go off our own direction. So the only way we can return to the Lord is with God's help. John. Going back to the original saying, the thing that I find missing, hold fast to love. And these people that don't believe in anything, what does love mean to them? That's what I always think. That, that always ah, yeah, me. hold fast to love. So, you know, they, they have some knowledge of God, but not necessarily saving knowledge. But God is the one that teaches us love, I think. You're right. God is the one that teaches. And so now you get the, the connection there. So Hosea is saying, hang on to that love. That love is from God. It's not from the things of this world instead of being attached to the things of this world. So you're getting a message of concern for the people, to, for them to return back to the Lord, and that God still loves them, still forgives them, um, and just as a reminder, you know, you do have a little bit of this knowledge within you. You just need to repent of your ways and turn back. Uh, but they're still being stubborn. <laughs> Not that we're ever stubborn, right? Oh, no. No, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, fortunately for us, even though we can be very stubborn, we have a God who is very, very gracious. And we wouldn't be alive otherwise. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what Luther is trying to communicate in uh, this uh, explanation. Without God's continual mercy and intervention, as John said, we wouldn't be alive. You're right. We would not have God's grace. We would have eternal death and damnation. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, continue on and find out some of the misgivings that they were doing. Verse 7. A merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress. Mm -hmm. 
okay? And so bringing this up from Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So does God, is God concerned about the economy? Well, yes, but mostly he's concerned about your heart. Are you trying to oppress people and cheat people, or are you just trying to deal fa fairly with them? Okay. Yeah. So God says, you know, let's, you know, cling to love, cling to justice. Let's deal fairly with people. But if you love to oppress, be careful because you're soon going to be oppressed. Mm -hmm. That's where the king of Assyria is going to come in. Uh, now, here's the fun thing. Eight. Ephraim has said, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself in all my labors. They cannot find in me iniquity or sin. <laughs> From 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So I want to put this picture out there. Okay, I'm not going to use any concrete names or examples. Just picture somebody having so much power in this world that they think that they are above the law. I love the snickering. I'm not going to add any names. I'm sure your own mind can come up with various names to insert there. But this is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. So Ephraim is basically saying, hey, I'm rich, I, I'm well blessed, look at all these things. You can't see any sin or iniquity in me. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, and then what we've just recently heard, because uh, we've gone through a lot of um, uh, First John in the daily devotions and in some of our readings in church, if we, and plus it's in our confession for right now, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay? And, you know, we have seen people uh, all of a sudden, after they rise to the top, so to speak, and then all of a sudden the federal government comes on in and says, hey, by the way... Yeah, okay. But I, I want to bring in a hymn stanza uh, from a well-known hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, stanza three. We, we sing, when we sing this hymn, Cure your children's warring madness. Bend our pride to your control. Shame our wanton selfish gladness. Rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss your kingdom's goal. Lest we miss your kingdom's goal. Ah, uh, yes, our warring madness. Nothing wrong with receiving the many gifts from God and saying, thank you, Lord, and extending that appreciation to the Lord uh, for those things. So the things don't necessarily get us into trouble. It's the love of things. And it's the poor in soul that sort of brings into the problem. So again, we are well blessed if you take a look at the world's economy. Uh, you're living in the western burbs of uh, Chicagoland. Uh, we are extremely well blessed. Uh, but the key thing is that we give great praise and thanks to God for these blessings. And we don't attribute them to ourselves. And we realize, as, the last, as that verse said, uh, we do see our iniquity and sin. And we confess it. Okay, So we don't fall into that trap per se, even though we are well blessed. Let's go on to verse 9. I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feasts. So what are we talking about? A camping trip? Well, not exactly. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16, verse 16 through 17. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. Each person shall take an omer. Uh, this is referring to the manna. According to the number of persons that each of you has, ha has in the tent. And the people, did, the people of Israel did so. They gathered uh, some more and some less. So in the wilderness... God fed them. Mm -hmm. God took care of them. And they were wandering around. Were they always faithful? 
The answer is no. That's why they had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. But God took care of them. Uh, and they lived in tents. They didn't have permanent dwelling places. They were wanderers. Yes, John. The thing that amazes me is they don't call them Bedouins. You're right. Or nomads. Hmm? Or nomads. Or nomads, right. Right. Uh, nomads are different. They, they, were, they were God's people on the way to the promised land. So God has given them a land, had given them a permanent place to dwell. They hadn't gotten there yet. Because of their disobedience, they had to take the long, extended, scenic route. <laughs> Joking. Um, but mostly they had to learn something. And now here comes the question, do we learn something? So let me go to the next slide. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 42 and 43. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here we're talking about the festival or the Feast of Booths. Okay, just think, you, you, what would happen if, as you see my question here, does the, why does the church have a penitential period? You know, during time of Lent, especially, Advent is also <coughs> penitential. We have extra services on Wednesdays, right? Midweek services, focusing upon <coughs> our need for God's grace and mercy. Okay, so the Festival of Booths were designed to do that. You're going to leave your home. You're going to set up a tent, and for seven days, you're going to live in booths. Okay, so now think what would happen instead of having midweek services. I said, well, instead of doing, you know, six midweek services for, at an hour each, why don't we just live for seven days in a tent? Is it heated? Is it, not? is it heated? Okay, See thank you. you. <laughs> How thick is the mattress? Can right. I bring? Do I get heat? Do I get my uh, Kirk coffee maker in the morning? Oh, there's no electricity. Oh, there's no electricity. <laughs> Two weeks. Why would we do this to remind us that this is how the people of Israel live? This is how God provided for them. You have to rely on God's mercy. And we're sitting there going, uh, can I just take the one hour once a week? Uh, it's a very good time of reflection to sit there and say, yes, we are well blessed by God. Okay, just think in your spiritual pilgrimage, did you ever have to live in tents? Going out and collecting your manna every morning. Mm. You know, it gets me. What are they sleeping on? Sand? I, I just Not as comfortable as what you are sleeping on. I'll just put it that way. Well, there probably were no bottoms in the tents. So, so it would be seen. Yeah, so they were probably sleeping on the ground. Um, and not in the nice, uh, cushy bed or uh, that we live, sleep water. in. But anyway, let, let's go on. So again, just a challenge out there when we start thinking about this Feast of Booths. That should be a beautiful reminder. Wait a minute. God is taking care of you. You've got it really nice. You should be thankful for what you've got. Here's the second challenge to this. Verse 10. I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. And I'm using a New Testament quote here to build up on this one from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom, he, through whom also he created the world. So God had given them the prophets. God has given them the lands. They are well blessed. And how do they repay God? By chasing after other gods. And so Hosea is bringing this to their account here, starting with Jacob. And you have, yeah, Jacob can be a little bit of an interesting read, okay? <laughs> Reminding us of our rebellion. But yet, he was still faithful. Now, God has brought the people of Israel through uh, 
uh, from Egypt into the promised land. God has provided for them, taken care of them, and now they want to return back to Egypt. They want to send the oil back there because that's what they're trusting in. So God has a charge against them. And now let's go on to verse 11. If there is, iniqu if there is iniquity in Gilead, they shall surely come to nothing. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Their altars are also like stone heaps on the fur furrows of the field. And I want to pair this immediately with Joshua chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones that they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. So you have the Gilgal as a, a reference to like the welcome center, welcome to the promised land. You know, if you did any traveling uh, via car to one state to the next, you got those great welcome signs. And then usually there was some sort of uh, rest area to sort of showcase the, what the state offers, so to speak, to increase uh, tourism. But the problem is, was that the place of worship where God promised to be? No. So here they're going to Gilead. Here they're going to Gilgal. Were they going to Jerusalem? No. And so, again, you have um, their actions being a witness against them. Uh, but let me bring in uh, Luther here. Uh, Luther has an interesting take on this. That I just wanted to bring it in. Uh, if in Gilead... He seems to be touching on an episode of history which has not been recorded. It seems that Gilead and Gilgal made comparisons between themselves. One wanted to have a greater name than the other. Uh, Gilead uh, is the region across the Jordan. Gilgal is on the side of the Jordan, on this side of the Jordan. It is as if he were saying, you are just as godly as the people in Gilead they stink in comparison with you. <laughs> Bottom line to it, as Luther would probably, Luther is probably saying, hey, there might be more to the story about Gilead and Gilgal that we don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. But bottom line is, you're not returning to the Lord. Return to the Lord, return to Jerusalem. Don't worry about Gilead and Gilgal. John. Uh, coming out of the Jordan, does that mean they were fishermen and these other people were not fishermen? The Jordan was also a river, yeah, so you could fish out of that. I don't know how the fish well, were. Coming out of the but Jordan for one reason or another. It was also it was also a boundary line. Yes. So it's like crossing a state boundary. So this is your land now. So that's why it was one of those nice demarcation points and saying, Hey, this is what God has promised you. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were not in the Jordan that long, you're saying. Yeah, when they crossed the Jordan uh, from uh, Joshua, they set up the 12 pillars as a, a testimony to God's uh, faithfulness in bringing them that far, uh, one for each tribe. And so, yeah, you had that, but you weren't supposed to be worshiping that, just like the bronze serpent. Do you remember uh, when the serpent when the, uh, were biting and killing the people of Israel because of the rebellion, and then God told Moses to make a bronze serpent? And whoever would look on the bronze serpent will be saved. But then the people of Israel started worshiping the bronze serpent. Mm -hmm. And so God gave instructions for the bronze serpent to be destroyed. Okay. And that's part of the problem that the people of Hosea's time uh, were experiencing. They forgot about God. But uh, let's um, get back to Jacob here and Hosea. From Hosea 12.12. 12. Jacob fled to the land of uh, uh, Aram. There Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he guarded sheep. Okay, so what's this back and forth business with Hosea doing with um, uh, Jacob here? Well, this verse highlights Jacob's experience in Aram, illustrating his humble beginnings and the toil he endured to build his family and wealth. It serves as a reminder of God's faithfulness to Jacob, despite his flaws and mistakes. 
Yes, the patriarchs made mistakes and the matriarchs, okay? And emphasizes the importance of perseverance and trust in God's provinces. Province. So again, putting the strong emphasis that yes, we're sinners, but we still look to God for grace and mercy. And Jacob did. Even though there were some <clears throat> interesting things in Jacob's life, okay, but he trusted in the Lord and he served faithfully and God blessed him. And now the people of Israel are so well blessed they forgot about God. So let's go on to uh, uh, finishing up here. Uh, verse 13, by a prophet the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt. And by a prophet, he was guarded. So what do we mean by a prophet? Probably referring to Moses. This verse underscores the significant role that the prophets, particularly Moses, played in the history of Israel. They served as God's messengers, leading and guarding the nation and conveying his will to the people. So why was this so important? Because they had forgotten what the prophets had told them. And because they had forgotten what was going on from God, from the prophets, they had abandoned God. And so God is reminding them through Hosea, wait a minute, I sent you the prophets to guard you. Okay? And that means to kind of keep you on the right path. Yes, you can rebel against them. That goes back against uh, to uh, John's uh, opening question here. You know, do the people make the leader? Or does the leader make the people here? And then to answer that from with this verse, God had established the leader, but then the people chose not to listen to the leader. Yeah. Okay, and that can happen. But God says, hey, I've already, I sent you the leader. You were supposed to listen. If you don't choose to listen, that's on you, not on God. Okay, let's finish up this chapter here, verse 14, and we'll end here for today. Ephraim has given bitter provocation, uh, so his Lord will leave him blood guilt, leave his blood guilt on him, and will repay him for his disgraceful deeds. So picking this up from Numbers chapter 35, verses 33 through 34, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. Now, there's a lot to this, so let's just sort of try to unpack a little bit of it. So you have the illustration of the shedding of one blood, staining the land, so to speak. So you could call that uh, your sins, your disobedience, okay? And so you have uh, Moses writing to the people of uh, Israel in Numbers, you shall not pollute the land. So it's not talking about litter. It's talking about disobeying God. When you turn against God and say you kill one another, if you start thinking of the blood pouring out to the soil like Cain killing Abel, okay? Uh, so, and no atonement can be made for this. You cannot atone for that sin. You cannot go and reclaim that blood and restore that life. Right. Okay. Uh, as Cain killed Abel, he couldn't sit there and say to God, you know, I made a mistake. Let me go and gather up the body. Let me gather up the blood and put everything back together again. Okay, God? And the answer is no. Super glue and duct tape won't work. It's only God who creates life and God who restores life. Okay, so God has an interesting thing. So he takes this idea of blood guilt and says, I will send himself, so to speak. God takes on human flesh and blood and then suffers and dies on the cross. He sheds his blood to atone for our sins because we cannot. So you get a little bit of a hint of that all in here. But going back to Hosea, to sort of finish this up, um, but God, God is basically saying to uh, Ephraim and the northern tribes, you have sinned, and I'm going to hold you responsible for it. 
And as Christians, we should probably sit, we should probably be screaming inside of us going, no, thanks be to God, we have a Savior who does atone for our sin. He sheds his blood because we cannot atone for our own sin. And because of another commitment I have in a little bit, I'm going to have to actually leave a little early today. Uh, so next week we'll be, uh, pick up uh, chapter 13 since I'm at a church, uh, chapter break. It works out well as we continue with Hosea. But let's uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.